Hello, dear friends, dear colleagues. It's a huge pleasure for me to speak to you today, obviously in a virtual conference. I would definitely have preferred to be with you in the lecture hall, having this physical contact, the eye contact. Unfortunately, this is not possible during the COVID period. I really hope that within next year, we'll all just look back and say, oh, those were the days of COVID. And now we move forward. So today, I sincerely hope that you will enjoy my lecture on ovulation triggering, which is an extremely important and new area of research and of great clinical importance. So today, I'm going to give you a lecture on ovulation trigger. And as you can see, we call this lecture the big bang of an adequate luteal phase because this is what everything is about when we talk about ongoing pregnancies and live birth rate, the luteal phase. This is my disclosure slide. Now, the outline of my lecture is that we're going to go into some luteal phase physiology and see the correlation which exists between progesterone and the endometrial receptivity go into the early luteal phase after HCG and agonist trigger, and finally look into the correlation between middle progesterone and the reproductive outcomes, that's live birth, and finally some concluding remarks. Now, I just want to take you back to the old textbook, and here obviously what we're talking about is the time of implantation during natural cycle on days 8 to 10 after ovulation. What we see here is obviously a peak of progesterone black dots and of uh, estradiol, but we definite in red, and we definitely also see a peak of red dots, which is hydroxyprogesterone. Now, hydroxyprogesterone has got exactly the same effects as progesterone. It's approximately one third of the circulating progesterone production. So you can see that all these hormones, they had their peak at peri-implantation. Now, what we learned over the years was that once we start stimulated, stimulating our patients, the luteal phase is going to be disrupted due to the fact that once you have more than three follicles, you will have high progesterone, high estradiol during the early luteal phase. And specifically, the high progesterone will exert a negative feedback on the hypothalamic pituitary axis, so LH levels will be low after stimulation in the luteal phase. Now, I'd like to show you the surge of gonadotrophins induced during natural cycle. You can see the natural cycle surge of gonadotrophin. It consists of three limbs, an ascending limb, a plateau phase, and a long descending limb. Now, during these 48 hours, FSH and LH is secreted. When we use an HCG trigger, we have this highly Superphysiological LH activity level, which is around for at least six days after the trigger. In contrast, when we use an agonist trigger, the surge has only got two limbs a quick ascending limb of four hours and a long descending limb of 28 to 32 hours. I think we can all see that the collective amount of gonotrophins, that is LH and FSH secreted, is significantly less as compared to the natural cycle. Then recently our British colleagues introduced kispeptin as a trigger. Again, you see the surge here, which again is significantly shorter, and we are back to baseline after 12 hours. So if we compare to an agonist trigger, even less LH FSH is secreted during the kispeptin surge. Just to show you again that kispeptin works on the uh, hypothalamic level, whereas the agonist works on the pituitary level, but the action is the same. It's release of LH and FSH. And this is why we can use these two substances as for ovulation trigger. Now, again, just to look into the differences between kispeptin trigger and agonist trigger, you can see that the kispeptin LH level peaks at 40 IU after four hours and already uh, after 12 hours, we're back to baseline, which is around 8 IU. In contrast, the peak of the agonist trigger is significantly higher, 130 units after four hours. And at 12 hours, we have still got quite a lot of uh, LH 55 units, and we're only back to baseline after approximately 36 hours. So significant differences 
taking, uh, impacting the circulating LH levels when we use these two triggers. Here you see them all gathered to, together, Kispeptin agonist HCG trigger versus natural cycle. Now, we know over the years there's been a lot of discussion about to use or not use LH activity during follicular phase. But when we move into luteal phase, there's no discussion whatsoever because LH is crucial for the function of the luteal phase because LH is completely responsible for the stereogenic activity of the corpus luteum. LH upregulates growth factors, which are important for neovascularization around the implanting embryo. LH also upregulates cytokines like, like LIF, which is involved in implantation. And obviously, we've got the LH receptors in the endometrium, which take part in the implantation process when the uh, implanting embryo with, via secretion of HCG, which obviously is LH activity, communicates with the endometrium via the LH receptors placed there. Just to show you the correlation between LH and progesterone. So when we say LH, we actually also say progesterone during luteal phase. You can see for each spike here in this natural cycle of LH, you will have a subsequent spike of progesterone. So LH induces progesterone production in the corpus luteum. So we talked about LH and we say that every time we mention LH, we also actually say progesterone. So what are the luteal effects of progesterone? Well, I think we all know that progesterone will transform the endometrium into the receptive phase. That's the secretoric phase by opening the window of implantation. LH, sorry, progesterone also increases vascularization. Progesterone works as an immunomodulator protecting the embryo all the way down through the tube, but also around peri-implantation in the uterus. And an, another important fact, impact of progesterone, obviously, is that progesterone reduces uterine contractions around the time of implantation. Now, you could ask me, so Peter, what are the mid luteal LH levels? Well, you can see it's around six to eight IU during natural cycle in the mid luteal phase. Once we use an agonist trigger, as I mentioned, the LH released is significantly lower, the amount after the agonist trigger. So there is a reduction by nearly 75% in mid luteal LH levels when we use an agonist trigger. When we use an HCG trigger, it looks even worse. But remember, we have the HCG now to cover for the LH activity deficiency because we use the HCG as a trigger. LH is low, but we have uh, HCG as a substitute to cover for the luteal phase insufficiency induced. So this is how we would have loved everything to look like. Use an HCG trigger and the LH activity is around until day eight, which is the time of uh, implantation. Uh, so the HCG trigger would cover all this phase until the embryo itself starts producing HCG, which then will support the corpus luteum. But we have to ask ourselves, is this actually true? And it's not. This is a very early study from Israel by Weissmann. And these are two hypo-hypo patients, patient A and patient B. And you can see they were administered three different regimens of HCG. So in the upper panel, 10,000 units subcute lower 10,000 units intramuscularly and lowest 5,000 IU administered intramuscularly. I think we can all see why we use HCG as a subcute substance because this is there where we get the highest and the longest duration of the HCG. But please also note the huge difference between these two patients. They were administered the same bolus, but patient A uh, reached a level of 300 IU of HCG in serum, whereas patient B uh, reached a level of 1,200 IU HCG in serum. So there are very distinct differences in the way that our patients respond to our treatment. Now, when does the embryo implant? Well, this is where the embryo implants. So what we can say is that at this time, there's no HCG around any longer. Obviously, there's still some progesterone, but HCG is out of the body. 
what we have to ask ourselves is, is serum progesterone predictive of the endometrial receptivity? A very elegant study from 2017 looking into this, looking into volunteers who were treated with different doses of progesterone in a in an, um, cycle in which patients first were, had a down regulation, then they were treated with estrogens for 10 days, and then they were treated with progesterone for another 10 days. And on the 10th day of progesterone treatment, a, 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 a endometrial biopsy was performed to look into histology. Now, here you see the different doses, and you also see that obviously over day, there will be a, there'll be a peak and a throw level. So just after injection, the serum progesterone is gonna be high, and then some hours later, it's gonna be lower. And this is for all doses. You see the different doses, 40, 10, five, and 2.5 milligrams. Now, in the panel below, you see the, the um, days of histological delay, and the interesting thing is, and if you go to panel C, you can see that the endometrium is receptive in all cases, but not in the lowest dose, the 2.5 milligram. I think this is quite obvious. You see uh, the typical uh, receptivity pattern, uh, histological pattern, but not in C. So if you use the histology, the histology will tell you that all these endometria are receptive. But now we are 2020, we have to go into gene expression. And if we do so, we can see that only the patient who had the highest circulating progesterone, the 40 milligram, had a receptive endometrium comparable to the controls of that study. So yes, serum progesterone is a good proxy of gene expression and of endometrial receptivity. Now, is serum progesterone predictive of live birth in art? Well, we looked into this quite recently, a large study, prospective study of 602 IVF patients, and we uh, did logistic uh, regression analysis. And here you see panel DEF looking into positive HCG, clinical pregnancy, and live birth. So let's stay at panel F. Patients had a blood sample on oocyte retrieval plus five, just one blood sample, and we correlated the serum progesterone to the live birth rate. And if you have a look here, you can see there are differences, clinically relevant differences. And you see the typical bell-shaped curve in which too low, that's less than 150 nanomolar on oocyte retrieval plus five, gives you a live birth rate of 42, whereas the most optimal gives you a live birth rate of 54%, so a difference of 12%. And being too high, above 400 nanomolar on this specific day, you can also see this is also negative. You, you lose like 16%. And remember, th this is adjusted OS ratio. So logistic uh, regression analysis taking into account uh, the embryo quality, et cetera, et cetera, age, uh, number of uh, transfers. So this is true data, just showing you that there seems to be an optimal level around peri-implantation between 150 to 250 nanomolar. Now, the scary thing was that only 50% of patients were inside the window. So inside this 150 to 250, 50% 50 of patients were outside. So this is why we are telling ourselves, well, probably if we did some kind of monitoring, we would be able to find these patients and maybe, maybe be able to do something. So the patients who were low, we could supplement in the patients who were high, we would probably do a segmentation. Obviously, we need to do this in trials to see, uh, to repeat uh, these findings and to see that the efficacy of doing segmentation or supplementing with uh, additional progesterone actually has an impact. Now, when we talk about mid serum progesterone, we also need to take into consideration the high degree of daytime variation. This is the st study from my PhD student, and I think it's an elegant study. She took all these blood samples over day from 6.30 in the morning to nine o'clock in the evening. And what you see is a number of patients here, approximately 10 patients who had this repeated blood measurement. Now, this is the level of 150 nanomolar. What we see, the vast majority of patients are above, but we also have patients who are below. In specific, patients seven and eight are extremely low. Now, if we go in 
to their files, you will see that these patients had 17 and 19 follicles, but the progesterone levels were extremely low, despite the fact that they were triggered <clears throat> with HCG and they had a, not, a neutral phase support. Now, if we look into 36 and 56 nanomolar, this is actually what you get by the vaginal support only. So it just tells us that these patients had no function of no endogenous function of their corpus luteum. So these patients would probably very, never get pregnant in a fresh cycle. Those are the patients who get uh, pregnant only when we use a frozen embryo transfer. But if we don't measure, we don't see the reason why. In the old days, we would say, well, this is quite odd with this patient. She only has a live birth when we use our fr her frozen embryos, not when we use the fresh embryos. The reason for this is what you see here, a a very poor function of the corpus luteum. Now, can the corpus luteum be trusted at all? Well, many years ago, 98, uh, sorry, 81 already, it was stated that there's a high variability in corpus luteum function from cycle to cycle and also from patient to patient. And we never took this into consideration in our daily clinical work. But here, this is data on file from my colleague, uh, Leif Bongum. What you see is three cycles in two different ladies uh, looking into the progesterone levels. So the function of the corpus luteum during mid luteal phase. What you see is that actually uh, just one of these three cycles reached a level which would say would be a conception cycle, which is around 30 nanomolar or 10 nanogram per mil. One out of three were normal. We see this also, the same pattern also in a very recent paper looking into natural cycle frozen embryo transfer and measuring progesterone levels. So this is natural cycle, no exogenous support, measuring progesterone levels the day before transfer. What we see is that there are 37, so more than one third of patients had levels less than the 10 nanogram per mil and the others were above two thirds were above, but one third, one third were below. And these patients had a significantly lower live birth rate as you see it in green. And the difference between above and, and, and below 10 nanogram per mil is 15%, 1.5% in live birth rate with the same high quality blastocyst. So this just tells us we cannot rely on natural cycle. If we wanna use natural cycle, we still probably need to supplement or at least we need to measure, to monitor, and then add on if we see a low progesterone level. And actually, this was already reported back in 2011 by Bustin. Here, this is natural cycle, uh, supplementation with progesterone vaginally or no progesterone. And what you see is a difference of 10% in live birth rate in this large study in favor of vaginal support with progesterone if you use natural cycle. Just telling us that we cannot rely on the corpus luteum function because uh, only one out of three cycles have a normal, completely normal function of the corpus luteum. Now, what is the early luteal phase reality of an HCG trigger? We touched upon this briefly just previously, but I have some new data that I'd like to show you. This is from this year from Professor Wong of Vietnam. And what we see here is the early luteal phase profile of more than 160 patients who had the standard gold trigger, uh, the gold standard trigger of 6,500 IU. What we see is that HCG peaks around 12 hours after the trigger, and it's around 130 IU. At the same time, in panel B, you see the progesterone level. The progesterone level peaks around oocyte retrieval plus two days. Now, on oocyte retrieval plus six days, there's no HCG around any longer. And what we see is also that Progesterone is, is, has already started declining at this time. So this is prior to implantation. So this is a stimulated cycle, HCG trigger. Progesterone already starts declining prior to implantation. Obviously, LH levels are very low because progesterone levels are very high and uh, having a negative impact on the pituitary. Now, what does the luteal phase progesterone in natural look like, natural cycle look like when we compare to the HCG triggered cycle. 
Well, you see the hyperstimulated cycle has got the peak of progesterone significantly earlier than the normal cycle. The normal cycle, which has got the peak of the bell just around implantation. So what we are introducing when we trigger with HCG is a tsunami of progesterone, which could cause like uh, an endometrial asynchrony when the, em when the finally when the embryo is going to implant. So this is the luteal phase reality after an HCG trigger, approximately six and a half days, then no more HCG around, progesterone is declining, and we still didn't have the embryo to, to implant to produce its own HCG. The tsunami, you can see here, progesterone is declining, and this is why we need to add progesterone support, and probably we just needed to add it to cover this gap of progesterone until the embryo starts producing HCG when it's well implanted. Now, is this true that we could actually stop our luteal phase support in a good HCG uh, implanting embryo? We, could we stop on the day of the pregnancy test? Well, a Danish group looked into this many years ago, and you can see two groups, a study group and a control group. They were all triggered with HCG. One group stopped the vaginal support on the day of the pregnancy test, the other one continued until eight weeks. And here you see the results, no significant difference whatsoever in live birth rate, in ongoing pregnancy, or in early pregnancy loss. So yes, physiology tells us the truth. We don't need in a standard patient who's triggered with HCG, if you have a good HCG level, <clears throat> you don't need to add more vaginal progesterone after the day of the pregnancy test. And this is actually what we are doing in our Danish and Nordic units. Many years ago, since this paper came out, we stopped all luteal phase support on the day of, a, of uh, pregnancy testing. So what about agonist trigger? Well, we know that when we simulate, we will have high levels of estradiol and progesterone, which have a negative impact uh, on the hypothalamic pituitary axis, which reduce LH levels. Now, if we then add an agonist trigger, which I showed you introduces even lower LH levels, we will have a dual negative effect on circulating luteal LH levels. A re quite recent paper looking into the early luteal profile of agonist trigger using three different doses of uh, agonist. And just to show you again that you have the peak of the LH level and it's around 150 units four hours after you have, uh, we are around 50 and then at 24 hours, we're nearly back to baseline. So this is the reality of the early luteal phase after an agonist trigger. We have the surge of LH, which has more or less disappeared around 26 to 32 hours. So we have a high and a long LH activity deficiency period until the embryo implants. Now, when we started the agonist trigger studies, obviously our idea was to be able to transfer fresh. I know that the majority of you use the agonist trigger for segmentation. But in, our, in my unit, we use the agonist trigger for fresh transfer because over the years, we performed several randomized control trials trying to find out how can we rescue the luteal phase after an agonist trigger. Now, the first trials were performed in 2005 by us and by the Belgium group. And what they showed there was that if you use a an agonist trigger and a standard luteal phase support, you will have a very high early pregnancy loss. We then did additional studies because we wanted to know what is the problem here. Remember, we didn't know, and this is just now, 15 years ago, 1-5. So we looked into follicular fluids of those patients who had an agonist trigger, looked excellently well, very close to natural cycle. We looked into the outcomes of frozen embryo transfers deriving from agonist trigger, comparing those to HCG trigger, also looked comparable, no difference. We looked into amphiregulin levels in follicular fluid after agonist trigger and comparing those to HCG trigger and natural cycle. And amphiregulin is the mediator of LH action inside the follicle. So amphiregulin levels should neither be too high nor too low. And after an agonist trigger, the level of amphiregulin was very close to that of the natural cycle, whereas HCG trigger caused superphysiological 
amphiregulin levels. So again, indicating that in terms of the follicular fluid and the embryos and the conditions inside the follicular fluid, the agonist trigger actually introduced excellent conditions. So the only thing we could point at was a lupal phase insufficiency caused by low LH levels. So just taking us back again, we then said, what can we do? Can we add a little bit of LH activity just to cover this gap until the embryo starts implanting? So we decided to add a bolus of 1,500 units of HCG on the day of oocyte retrieval in these patients. And over the years, as you can see, we performed three uh, quite large randomized control trials in which, in red, the only thing we were manipulating it with was the luteal phase support. Now, in the first study, we used just vaginal gel, nothing else. In the next study, we added the 1,500 units of HCG. And in the third study, in some of our patients, we decided to add an additional bolus. So a total of two boluses of LH activity on 1,500 units HCG, one on the day of oocyte retrieval and the other on oocyte retrieval plus five. And have a look at this. You can see that once progesterone levels go up, pregnancy losses just go very, very low, and the clinical and going and live birth rates increase to show you how important progesterone is and progesterone actually will determine the early pregnancy loss. The lower the progesterone around mid luteal phase, the higher the early pregnancy loss. So progesterone, pregnancy loss, and live birth correlate very nicely with each other. Now, just to show you because you would say, come on, Peter, we don't use an agonist trigger and modified luteal phase support. We just use the agonist trigger for segmentation. Yeah, I know. But I just wanted to show you this small meta-analysis that we did, including all our papers in a, and, and two other papers to show that if you use modifications, this could be usually HCG, smaller boluses of HCG during the luteal phase in a non-OHSS risk patient, you will achieve the same pregnancy rates this is here, clinical pregnancy rate in an intention to treat analysis as compared to an HCG trigger. So yes, the agonist triggered luteal phase can be rescued by adding LH activity, but you cannot transfer uh, fresh in an agonist triggered cycle and just use vaginal support. You need to add modifications. It, and in our hands, it's HCG. So I think I was able to show you that the agonist trigger actually was the compound which opened the black box of the luteal phase, but there's still much more to be learned. And just to go to the conclusion, today I showed you that there is a lower cutoff of mid luteal progesterone at perium implantation, and that serum measurements give you very good uh, indications of what's going in, on in the in terms of endometrial receptivity. The lower cutoff is 150 nanomolar, and the, the most optimal level is from 150 to 250 nanomolar in fresh transfer cycles. We all know that luteal phase support remains mandatory after COS, controlled ovarian stimulation, to cover the gap until the trophoblast produces sufficient amounts of HCG. I also showed you that luteal phase support can be stopped on the day of pregnancy test in fresh transfer cycles. But what I think we, you and I and all of us should definitely consider is monitoring mid luteal progesterone levels in our fresh cycles in addition to the frozen cycles, because I think a lot of us started monitoring our, froze, our frozen cycles, but in future, we're gonna monitor mid luteal progesterone levels in fresh cycles also. And this is the way to increase the reproductive outcomes in our IVF ICSI cycles. So I think for many years, we've been walking on a very, very thin line when we talk about the luteal phase in ART. If we don't get it right, we're going to fall down. But there's a lot to explore, many more trials to be performed. But we still, just within the last 10 years, we learned a lot. Thank you very much.